Okay, let's. I'm I'm more in a middle game mood to start. So okay. what I'm thinking of I'm doing down. is, uh, you know, sort of I'll give you a warm up problem, and then after that, I'm thinking of doing some work in the area that we were doing last time, sort of the the intersection of tactical and positional thinking, giving you as much practical advice as possible on the general topics of of you know calculation, positional reasoning, without just pounding random calculation problems, if you know what I mean. Because I know that yeah. you mentioned that you sort of do that kind of stuff yourself. How does that generally sound? Yeah, I have been trying to two tactics today. Let's start with a sort of a simple, simple study. Uh, very, very simple, just to get kind of get your confidence back up. I think you'll get this one quickly. Um, this is the ending of a of a relatively famous study. Um, but it's uh, just a couple couple move combinations. So pasting it in right now. Oh, 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 it's I think it's simpler than you think just to get Okay, kind of okay. Pacing. Like, I'm just like, how, how simple? No, no, I won't give you one of those like provocative studies that's like 15 moves. Like, yeah, I get a little simple Russian style. No, actually, <laughs> like, I think actually simple, but take as again, same rules apply. Take as long as you need. I'm never going to rush you. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, my chat, you can always get involved as well in the comments. So white to play and win here. Uh, uh, okay. Why do I win here? This, this looks, this looks like an end game I would potentially play. Yeah. Yeah. This is a very real, I think the best studies come from realistic, uh, realistic games. Um, okay. So Bishop to D2. Mm-hmm. Well, and so then. you're threatening. So I have two moves to stop. Check. You're threatening checkmate on a8. If I go mm -hmm. b4, trying to vacate some squares for my king. Right. I can go here and then take your rook. Bingo. And that leaves me with only one move, which is, of course, to take that bishop with check. Yeah. And then got king c3. Very nice. Rook a. And there's themes like this all around rook end games where you're attacking the rook and you're threatening checkmate. So I can go here, but that only staves off checkmate. Very nice. Pretty um, cool. Bishop d2, only winning move. We should also point out rook and bishop against rook in most cases is a draw. So it's not like I can do anything here and win. Right. Yeah. Um, so let's jump right into, we'll start in the sort of positional end of things. I'll give you a couple of positions through the lens of which hopefully we can talk a little bit about positional reasoning, how to incorporate, incorporate calculation into your general thinking without relying exclusively on your calculation. And hopefully I can sort of um, fill you up with as much advice as, as possible. But as usual, you know, stop me if I'm going too fast or too slow, talking too much. That's probably going to happen. So <laughs> don't worry, um, don't worry. let me paste in the next position. This is going to, again, be, I think, relatively simple. This is um, from an old game, an old Russian game uh, from Mikhail Botvinnik, who hopefully most of the uh, chat members are familiar with, of course. One Come of on, the chat. You guys are all like 2500s, right? Mikhail Moisevich Botvinnik, uh, world <laughs> champion from, from uh, the Soviet Union. One of the strongest players of the first and even the second half of the 20th century. And uh, one of Botvinnik's early games featured uh, this position that you see in front of you. Mm -hmm. And, well, of course, it's, if it was black to move, I would not be giving this to you. Uh, but <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I would maybe be giving this to, to Charlie. But it was uh, white to move. <laughs> <laughs> I just, oh, I've had to add that diss in there. Already throwing him under the bus. He will never forgive me for that diss. Never. <laughs> just don't, completely between us, chat. I didn't diss him. Uh, so, of course, three obvious candidate moves. Can you name them? Um, C takes D5, E takes D5, and the knight Man, takes D6. I think you're ready to take on Gary Kaspar. So, <laughs> yeah. the question is, which of these moves do you play and, and why? And you can be as conceptual or as concrete as you want. Wait, this is sorry. Is this was this tactical? I think I just like missed the. It's first more part. positional, so we're starting okay. more on the positional end of things. That doesn't mean there's no tactics and no, or no calculation, but I'm going to start on the positional end of things. We're going to move slowly toward the tactical realm. Sort of that's how I planned it. Thanks, Jair Mighty, for the sub. The prime Daichin. All right, let me figure this out. Okay, so. Um. I have played these kinds of positions mm -hmm. before. Mm 
I think I remember if I was playing for a draw, I would take back with the C pawn because of the pawn structure is symmetrical. Mm -hmm. um, and that usually leads to pretty equal end games. But if I take back with the E pawn, it gives me a little bit more playing chance because the E7 pawn on black side is going to be a little bit weak coming in the future. Mm -hmm. Very good um, reasoning so far. Other moves aside. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, that's my that's like the reasoning of what I think about the moves, but So E D would be your, your choice here. Yeah, probably. Probably. And you would be absolutely right. This is I think simpler than it looks. So it's mm -hmm. very important okay. to understand. Um, don't necessarily shy away from unbalanced pawn structures. And mm -hmm. the key here is to realize, like you pointed out, the C7 pawn is what's going to kill black in the long run. What yes. would be White's plan in, in a situation like this? White's long-term plan, given okay. you know the weakness that you just pointed out? Yeah, I mean, very simply, it would be to like, double up the rooks yeah. on the E file. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Double up the rooks on the E file, attack the target. So sometimes mm -hmm. against stronger players... There can be this temptation, as you point out, to go for the symmetrical pawn structure, <laughs> but this is actually worse for white. And it might yeah. seem like white has more space, but the reality is this bishop on g2 is clogged by white's own pawns, um, and, and black is the one who has immediate control over the c file. So something to the effect of taking everything, and even queen b6 can be very, very unpleasant for white. Um, so I largely think space advantages can be overrated, as we see in the Nimzo. Yeah, um, that is true. And... Here, white is white is struggling because of this bishop and because this rook is going to come to c8. The other rook is uh, pressuring a2. So e takes d5 is the key to the position. So the key here, not to be afraid of unbalanced pawn structures and identifying potential targets that you can uh, that you can pressure. That's sort of one of the best types of positions to strive mm -hmm. for. And knight takes c6 here, I should just point out very quickly, is it looks cool, but this yeah, is a little I bit inferior. It gives um, him a it gives black a very good center. Yeah, I mean even C D, this is just too many trades have happened. There's a lot of air going on here. Black can try to put his queen on B6, so no need to give black any extra advantages. Mm-hmm. That is true. Um okay, very, very good. Now let's get to some uh some more fun stuff. The next position I'm gonna show you made actually a very big impression on me. Okay. And the concept that I wanna talk about through its prism is, is what I call inaccessibility, and I'm gonna talk about what that is, of course. Um, and I'll let you try to solve the position. All right. This and is exciting. As soon as my computer unfreezes. Okay, there we go. Copy position. I think I've, I'm hyping this up, and you're going to be like, what is this crap? Okay. <laughs> so this is a game between two grandmasters, Sargisi and Tomaszewski, uh, from a couple of years back. Very, very strong players, both in the 2700s. Oh, all right. And don't be intimidated by that, though. I think you can find the move. So it's white to move, and the way that I suggest you approach this is prophylactically first asking yourself what is black's intention how does black intend to to develop active play in this position then of course you try to find ways to stop that but you'll mm -hmm. see that there is a catch so i'll i'll shut up and let you think about it okay so it's black's point of view it's white white to move oh white okay yeah yeah yeah, yeah. white sorry I, I wasn't clear on that white to move okay um I mean, the first thing you think about in these positions is the pawn breaks, right? So b5 or, or e4. Mm -hmm. Those are the automatic first thoughts. Um, ooh. Another sort of idea I might have actually no so right now i have like a dark squared bishop and all of my opponent's pawns are on the white light square interesting observation um so something hikaru wants to know if i like french fries with mayo <laughs> no i don't i like french fries with ketchup i personally hate mayonnaise actually really <laughs> can't stand it I I only like it if it's in, like, the Junior McChicken at McDonald's. If there's or... mayonnaise in anything, I'm throwing that sandwich out, unfortunately. I'm just... It's one of those things for me. <laughs> oh. But, um, yeah, five people in my chat are agreeing, so thank you, guys. How do you like, how do you like your steak? Uh, medium well. I used to actually get well done, but I've, as I got yes! older... Yes! I know. 
Well, oh wait, you're I on love, the same I love page. Well done okay, I love great. Well done Finally met I... someone who was similar because <laughs> oh my god, it changed when I was I was at my mom's birthday party. This is a couple of years ago. We went to you know like a nice Italian restaurant, and I got steak. Mm-hmm. And the I will never forget the look that I got from the waiter when I said well done. It was a look of pure and unadulterated hatred. Um, you know, I was not worth the, the, the chair that I was sitting on, nor the paper that I was printed on. So from that point on, I've started getting medium well, but okay. I'm a well done person at heart. All right. Awesome. Hell yeah. This is, this is against everybody in chat. Yeah. Okay. You snob, steak snobs. You're, you're still welcome <laughs> in the stream. So in any case, so, so I would actually approach this also remember from the perspective of Black's ideas as well. What is Black threatening here? And and threatening, um, I'll put in quotes. There's no, like, Black's not attacking any pieces here, and that's what makes this a little bit harder than usual. But it mm-hmm. still is a positional threat that Black has. I think E5. Very good. Very yeah, good. Definitely so, Black's idea here. Definitely. I was. That's why I was going to say, do I want to push F4, which locks my bishop in and leaves all of my opponent's pawns on the light squares? Or do I just let him push e5? That's the right question to ask. So in this situation, you would want to weigh the pros and the long-term pros and cons of playing f4. So what else does f4 weaken? Let's play um, this one on the board for a second. Because it does look kind of absurd from the perspective of squares. I do think that it gives Black the opportunity to play like g5 and stuff. But um, and, and just because the center is so close, like you can get away with it. What about oh, that e4 yeah. square? What if he ever gets a knight on e4? Do you, can you imagine yeah. how much of a nightmare that's going to be if he gets a knight yeah. to e4? You, I don't even have a light squared piece. <laughs> I can't even like swap out. That there. knight is going to be disastrous. If he slips a knight into e4, you're going to regret the day you were born. So is it worth then, given all these cons, the pro of f4 is obvious that it stops e5. What would be White's plan in this position? <laughs> um... Okay. So I would be going for like B5, I guess, right. opening up the queen side. Very good. And so when you look at this intuitively, and, and you can take as long as you need, do you think that it's, I'll retract this move to let you think from the starting position. Is it worth okay. flying F4 is the key question that you have to ask yourself here. Are the positives worth the negatives? Honestly, if my opponent just pushes e5 mm-hmm. and I don't do anything, the worst thing that he can play is e4 because I don't care if he takes on d4. Okay. But if he pushes e4, um, that might be a l- little bit annoying mm-hmm. um, just because I don't think I want to take back since he'll take back with the rook. Once again, just getting that outpost for himself. Good. And then that e3 pawn mm-hmm. is going to be a weakness that Black can, in fact, access. Right. So I was just thinking if I retreat my queen and he plays e takes f3, I play g takes f3. It's not quite an end game, but I also feel like my king's... I don't know. Like, I'm very okay with leaving my king kind of unsafe, so I never know if I have the best judgment for this. Mm-hmm. Um, but, yeah, I guess if it came down to a game that I would be playing over the board, I'd be playing b5 here immediately. So very, very interesting. In reality, the game continuation was f4. Oh. And and let's unpack this for a second. So normally, in my experience analyzing games mm-hmm. and, and looking at you know alpha zero and recent developments in chess computing, it appears to me that humans, and it's not just you, it's everybody, we tend to underestimate the danger of having an unsafe king. We tend to underestimate king safety as a concept. So this has actually changed my approach to the game somewhat. I feel like any sort of deficiency in king safety um, is a lot more. Thank you, thank you, Nepo, for the raid. Appreciate it. Um, well, now, now he's going to be watching this. What kind of what kind of crap are you talking about? But basically, I've never realized to what degree king safety is a crucial concept. Um, and even the slightest deficiency in king safety can be punished mercilessly. So let's unpack how that actually works in practice. I'm going to try to okay. convince you that it is worth stopping e5. Now, I'm going to take on b5 here so as not to give up mm-hmm. the pawn. And I'm yeah. going to go e5. And there's two problems that I want you to, to notice here. First of all, I want you to understand that it's going to be a while before white actually gets stuff done on the queen side. He's going to have to play rook b1. 
mm -hmm. then eventually go rook b6 and it's gonna take a while he might have to bring the other rook around to a6 right so it's a couple of moves black on the other hand e4 comes very very fast so which move here would you play um what move were you sort of processing beforehand i was just looking at queen d2 okay now i'm gonna take all right now i'm gonna go knight g5 <laughs> And I'm going to show uh -oh. you how quickly things start melting down here for white. Uh-oh. Right. This doesn't look too good. So I'm going to think about ways that I can involve my queen in the attack. One maneuver that immediately comes to my mind. Um, and I'm not looking at the end exactly. Or maybe queen <laughs> f7. Either one. Yeah. yeah. Maybe queen g6. I don't think it really matters. I was thinking about this. I was like, uh, I can like maybe get away with it. Right. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to let you take on g5 and claim that and then you're going to be at, left with a very weak pawn on e3. Oh, oh you want to do this. Okay. Yes. I wasn't going to take. All right. Let's add some Tabasco sauce here to the position. <laughs> oh, no. Uh, yeah. Don't go no Tabasco sauce. That's not good. I feel like I get the point. Yeah, yeah. So this just, w would you agree with me that this is at least a little bit unpleasant? Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. And you can um, see how it's hard from a distance to realize that all these problems kind of creep up on your king. It's not only the king safety. King safety is also a jumping off point because by solving your king problem, you're introducing other weaknesses into your position. So right. as a piece, general piece of advice, try to almost err on the side of caution when it comes to king safety. Mm -hmm. Now let's talk about f4 for a second. It has two principal defects. Thank you, uh, Al Brown, for the sub. First of all, the weakening of the e4 square. Second of all, the obvious blunting of the bishop. But both of these are either irrelevant or entirely short-term problems. So in terms of the e4 square, and I'll do the counting for you, Black needs a staggering eight moves to get his knight from f7 to e4. Eight. <laughs> and let me draw That's this out. Knight That's h8. Lie. Knight g6, knight e7, then he's got to move the king, he's got to go knight g8, move the queen, knight f6 at 94, eight moves in chess is in it, so the earth is going to turn into a supernova by the time yeah. that knight gets to e4. Um, that would be pretty intense. So that's what I call inaccessibility. Mm. You, you know that famous paradox of like a tree falling into the in the forest, and, mm. and, and the question is, does the tree make a sound if nobody hears it? So I yeah. treat weak squares the same way. A lot of people look at a weak square. Oh my God, I have blood. Oh, look at the square on e4. It's a nightmare. But a square is not weak if it's inaccessible to your opponent's pieces. So don't <laughs> be afraid to weaken a square if you have determined that your opponent cannot get a piece onto that square in a timely fashion. Okay. Um, Carlos Silva says you can do it in seven. Oh my goodness. And um, essentially... Um, <laughs> no, I think I, we get the point, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You I get think the, the point. point still stands. Yeah. So now let's get to the bishop. Um, this bishop can actually activate itself uh, via a certain mechanism. How? Can you find uh, a way for this bishop to reach some sort of life potentially in the future? E1, A5, C7. Yep, exactly right. That's exactly what happens later on in the game. White can attack at his leisure. Black has no counterplay. Mm -hmm. G5 can be simply ignored mm -hmm. um, with B5. And G takes F5 only introduces further weaknesses in Black's position, such as the E6 pawn. And yeah. I'm not going to show you the rest of the game. I think you get the point, as you mentioned. But White ended up winning this game. Okay. White ended up winning this game. And I so respect that. And so that's sort of the general... Uh, thrust of the insight I wanted to make about weak squares and inaccessibility and you know and realizing that it, it is okay to make positional concessions um mm -hmm. it chess is a game of concessions a game of tit for that tit for tat you cannot get everything yeah. all the time for sure let's practice this with a more classical game between Bobby Fischer and Wolfgang Unsicker in the in 1970 actually very very similar concept um, slightly different move, but very similar concept. The following position arose out of the opening. <laughs> and here Bobby Fischer with the white pieces applied the very same concept, doing the very same thing uh, in order to make a great deal of positional gain. He did weaken a particular square. So think okay. about this. Tell me what comes to mind. Wait, it's uh, white to move. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I feel like I just kind of play moves when I play Blitz, and I don't really think enough, so... 
Well, when I, I mean, it is an intuitive cookie. game, and here we're, we're really exaggerating the process of thinking, but that's also how you learn. You get better at subconscious decision-making when you mm. practice conscious decision-making. Yeah. No, but I'm not even joking. Today, I just shut off my brain. Like, I was literally just auto-moving. <laughs> auto All good. <laughs> um, yeah, okay, let's see. I'm trying to bait him somehow. Um... Okay... Well, I'm guessing... Black's light squared bishop is gonna struggle a little bit with developing because my knight's looking nice on d4 Very and also good. his king is still on this the, the the diagonal over here, so Very good. Good observation so far. Look at this light squared bishop and it's really only one prospect of developing, which is maybe mm -hmm. something like this. Um so yeah. maybe if you can close that bishop in somehow. Yeah, I was just thinking about playing h3, but then I, then I was also thinking, like, does it even matter if he plays it? Because I have, like, queen b3 check, and then queen takes b7. Yeah, but... that's true. That's true. Um, mm -hmm. But the way you can also think about it is, this bishop, if it's going to be a long-term problem, what can you tell me about this bishop on d6? Um, It's going to be the better bishop? <laughs> yeah, it's the, it's the better bishop. So imagine a scenario where you've traded the dark-squared bishop and left white, black with only the light-squared bishop. That will be mm -hmm. a game changer, right? I mean, that'll be, that'll revolutionize the whole position for white. Right. So then the question becomes, can you try to orchestrate the trade of the dark squared bishops here? Hmm. What kind of plan can you come up with to trade those bishops? Well, definitely f5 and bishop f4 is the okay. simplest. But what drawback does this have? That bishop e5? Have exactly, but that's this exactly huge, what Fischer I feel like it's a like huge drawback. Right. It, like, how can you weaken a square like this, and yet Fisher plays f5? Um, and if it was anybody other than Fisher, I'd probably look at this move and laugh at it. But let's unpack bishop e5 for a second. The reality is, just by putting a piece on this square... Mm -hmm. It doesn't necessarily mean anything, and white simply chases the bishop away. So, for example, here... White isn't even really in a hurry, but what White can do is give a check on b3, and then he could go rook a d1, but he could basically go knight f3, chasing the bishop away. And then he could maneuver this knight onto what square in order to permanently either chase the bishop away from d6 or trade it. One sec, I'm going to close my window. There's a very loud party going on in the pool. <laughs> in July 5th. Yep, exactly. The hangover party. All right, we're good. Um, I mean, we can try rook d1, and since it's pinned, just, just exchange the bishop off that way, but... Uh, Good idea as well. But specifically, how about with the knight, specifically? Knight d2, knight c4. Yeah, exactly what I had in mind, and that also opens up the possibility of bishop f4. So you see how just weakening a square alone does not necessarily guarantee your opponent a good position. Um, and so is this making sense so far? Yes, it is. Yeah. And queen e7 was played in the game, so how does Fisher follow this up? Um, We are still on a mission to exchange off that bishop. Yep. So bishop f4? Bingo. Bishop f4 trading off the bishops. That's exactly what happened. And black still had control over e5, but eventually what Fisher did was he brought his knight to f3. He placed his rook on e1, and he broke through with e5. And black was left with this dud of a bishop, this runt of a bishop, and eventually Fisher mm -hmm. just choked him out of air. Okay, um, I respect that. So, so the spirit that I sort of, you know, advise you to encompass is one of always being concrete and not letting positional preconceptions dictate the way that you play. Your immediate intentions in a position always have to transcend sort of general positional principles about weakening squares or doubling pawns or whatnot. So, you know, be a rebel on the chessboard is, is I guess, uh, a very shorthand way of saying that. Uh, so how does that generally sound to you? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, I definitely think that these are the kind of positional games where it's like, like if I start 
start thinking about it deeper i can definitely start understanding them but it's not really something i'm able to do in like a short period of time <laughs> right no but that's but that's okay and, and by looking at these positions carefully in in a, in a practice session you start to it's not the position specifically that that help you improve it's the thought processes that you put in place mm -hmm. if you think like that a couple times and and this isn't something that you recognize necessarily but before you know it you start applying those correct thought processes in blitz games. I think that's how improvement generally works. It's not something yeah. that goes on at the very surface. For sure, for sure. So let's proceed. Let's start to move a little bit closer to the realm of sort of specific tactical thinking. Maybe this will be a little bit more fun for you, but- No, I mean, I have positional puzzles, but I think it's something that like me and a lot of other people just sort of disregard, you know? Just sort of what? like disregard yeah and and what i want to make very clear to the chat and people who are like uh gla eyes to blaze oh, oh daniel's talking about this this positional i don't need to know that i'm too weak for that i don't think anybody's too weak for these concepts i try to illustrate them clearly and i think people can apply them at their own level um mm -hmm. you know be bold even if you're 1500 it's not like you're not allowed to apply positional con i don't buy into that whole school of thought of oh positional chess can only be started when you're at a certain rating i don't believe that I believe anyone can really come to understand these concepts if they're well taught, mm -hmm. you know, whether or not they're well taught. Well, that's, that's not for me to decide. That's for you guys to tell me. Um, I'm sure they could be taught better, but I, but I'm doing my best to lay them out, you know, in comprehensible terms. This is good stuff. Thank you. So let's move on to, this is an obscure game, uh, between mm -hmm. two relatively unfamiliar players. Black was a grandmaster from Yugoslavia. Uh, this is okay. a game from the 1960s. Now flip this so that you're facing black. All right. Um, and it is black to move here. I'm not going to introduce this in any way, but what I want you to do is try to make as many observations as possible, and then maybe that'll lead you to um, the correct move. This position shows you how you can marry positional thinking and specific calculation in the best possible way. Mm -hmm. I'm guessing black's supposed to be winning this. Mm -hmm. Black's supposed right. to be putting pressure, yeah. Okay. Um... Okay, well, I mean, all the pawns on the dark squares, which is horrible for white's bishop because it's a dark squared bishop. Um, it's pretty pog for us. Oh, thank you so much, Curly Queen, for the raid. Thank you. Uh, I do think it's pretty okay for us because even though it's also blocking our bishop, it's more it, white cannot take his own pawns. Yeah. So we got a nice. Point. We have a bishop that can do something. Uh huh. Yeah. Okay. We also have like the one open file. Well, the, we have the A file. Yep, on, on which our queen is parked. Yeah, and aside from that, our knight also has the potential to go to um, E4, even though you just do that. So I don't really know if like, this is not really a thought, but it's it exists. Did I introduce you to the three move rule? I don't think if I did it, last time. If, it, if it's not done in three moves, it doesn't exist. Yep. So how many moves is knight f8, d7? That's four One, moves. Two, yeah, okay. So, so that's very question. I mean, I wouldn't be dismissive of it in principle, <laughs> but in a position like this, which has quite a few pieces, and it's not like white mm -hmm. is frozen in space, I would yeah. put that on the back burner. I mean, at least I would start by looking at more immediate ideas. Right, for sure. But good application there. I'm glad you, are, you remember that and, and retained it. <laughs> it means a lot to me. <laughs> <laughs> um okay so something else that we can think about is maybe breaking through on the king side um uh, i mean obviously it's like a queen and minor piece end game so sacrificing for this doesn't really make sense unless there were less unless the queens got swapped off and maybe if the bishops got swapped off too right so yeah, i see a lot of people in chat suggesting sacks on f4 and h4 that's a classic mm -hmm. application of almost tactical brainwashing. I do that too, where you assume that any position that you're given the solution has to be very tactical. Yeah. But in real life, it's not always like that. There's some very mm -hmm. subtle maneuvers that are sometimes the solution. This is just one of those positions. Yeah. Um, I do think that at the end of the day, this pawn is probably gonna be quite weak. Um, if I do something like Bishop F6, is not gonna be able to attack it directly, which I'm most annoyed by. Yep, good. But, but are there any weak other weaknesses maybe that you can try to attack? There's the king, which is like right. chilling on D2. Good. We can maybe like put Queen A2 or something like that. Incorporate that into whatever combination you you choose. Yep, good. And other yeah. weaknesses. Um. There is one other pawn that definitely is weak by our definition. Und yeah, defensible. Yep. Okay. 
I mean, this is within the three move rule. Okay, so what can you tell me about the move knight c7 here? Looks a little bit awkward, um, kind mm -hmm. of like me at prom, but what, you know. Yeah, so does, I mean, you go for it. How does this end up? Yeah, you go for it. So knight c7, you're threatening knight a6, and if you play knight a6, the pawn on b4 is indefensible. So actually, believe it or not, white has only one way to defend that pawn, to lend reinforcement to that pawn. Wow. And And what would that be? <laughs> um Wait a minute. Knight C2, Knight C1, yeah. Knight D3. Very good. So yeah. let's play these moves on the board. Knight C1, Knight A6, Knight D3. <laughs> but now we see the tension has arisen over this pawn on B4. So Knight A6, Knight D3, black to move. Oh, and then there's just Knight takes B4. Exactly. B4, so B5. this is where the tactical component comes in. You never switch off your tactical detector even when you're looking for positional solutions. I don't know if you're playing the moves in my street. Yeah, you can go ahead and play knight takes before. Okay, yeah. Just to show the card. So if queen takes before, then the queen is pinned. So obviously I have to take this way. But it's still pinned. And that's it. The floodgates. I mean, it's not just a pawn that's won. It's the whole position that now collapses. For example, let's say I go king e2. Yeah, you really just don't win all your pawns on the dark screen. Yeah, this is the worst. This is what kills white at the end of the day. So how does black actually finish this off? Um, I don't think... Uh... I don't think it's right to exchange the queens. So I'm Yeah, not yet. Three. Yep, exactly. Bishop a3 is the best move. Very and simple. Exactly. And notice push. that the king... So queen e3, for example, trying to get the king to the queen to e8, what would be the sort of best way of disarming this? Mm. Now I'll give you a... Yep, exactly. Then the queen can come out to e4. Yeah. And because the pawn's already on b4, you, the queen trade is warranted because b3 comes very, very fast. Mm -hmm. yes. So this is sort of the marriage of tactical and positional thinking. We identify all the weaknesses, we come up with a positional idea. After our opponent defends against this idea... We switch gears and we start looking for a tactical solution at the end. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so let me paste in the next position. Give me a moment. All right. And this one is, again, um, it's going to be sort of a, a middle ground between positional reasoning and tactics, where there's, there's components of it, that, specific components of the position you have to take into account, but it also has a positional flavor to it. And uh, these are quite a bit more boring than the positions you find in, let's say, Puzzle Rush. And I'm doing that deliberately because I believe that this is real training. These are actual positions that arise on the board. Not... Yeah, my, yeah. I think I think this will be good for us. I, I've had a terrible, terrible Puzzle Rush day. For every tactic I did wrong, I had to eat a dose of wasabi. Oh, gosh, man. That <laughs> does not sound very fun. Thanks, Dragon, for the sub. So um, this is a position that... Happened between two, two 2600 GMs. Georg Meyer, uh, someone that's familiar to most viewers, was white. Okay. And it is white to move. Again, it's a situation where, where there's three feasible candidate moves. You can take on B5 with two different pieces, or you can take the queen on D8. And mm -hmm. it's a question of, well, how the heck do you approach a situation like this? How do you decide which piece to capture with? Um, and okay. take your time because there there is a correct solution here. It's not one of those woo woo kind of like oh all three are good. Um, there yeah. definitely is a correct solution here. So as long as you need. All right, I just want to let my chat know that I have turned them off, so I will not be reading chat. Absolute focus. I like it. I have to uh, <laughs> take a leak, so I'll be back in about a minute. That's okay. All right. All right. I'll be right back, chat. Okay. Um, like I said, I don't have my chat open, but I'm here thinking. So bishop's attacking my queen and my rook. If I take his queen, he can he has to take, basically take my queen. Um, so rook takes bishop takes a four. If I take on a eight, rook takes a eight. Then I have knight takes a four. After which we we will have equal material. Do we like that though? Do we want more? I feel like we always want more. Okay, I mean I'm down a whole minor piece in this position, so. If I take here, I'm going to be still attacking the queen. I'm also going to be attacking the bishop. So queen takes b5, queen c7. Maybe. Hmm. And then I have rook b5. But then there's bishop to d6. 
Wait a second. Oh. Okay, queen takes b5. Queen c7. Knight takes knight d5, and the queen just moves away. Okay, queen takes b5. Queen c7. I feel like it has to be this. I really, really do. All right, I am back. Welcome back. Um, yeah, I was just saying that I don't think it's going to be rook takes d8 because after rook takes d8, bishop takes a4, rook takes a8, rook takes a8, knight takes a4. We have the same amount of material. Right. And I feel like white wants something more. Yeah, and the bishop can just come back there, so it's really not... Mm -hmm. um... It, it's nothing nothing to write home about, exactly right. So we're down to basically two. Okay. Uh, so now we're down to queen takes b5. So first of all, I looked at knight b5 very, very brief, briefly, but I just feel like after queen b6, um, there is not much going on in that position. For right. Me. That's also a good point. So what can you say about queen takes b5? Well, queen takes b5, queen c7 is like your your only move, mm -hmm. kind of. Well, there's a there's sort of another possibility. Oh, there's like, oh, queen b6. Too. Right, so two possibilities, queen c7 and queen b6. Okay, um, I actually did not think about queen b6. Hmm. All right, well, maybe with queen b6, I can just play rook to d5. And you're attacking the two loose pieces the flag has. Yes. And what about queen c7? Um, I was also thinking about rook d5, but there's bishop d6 now. Exactly. So this speaks to the importance of being very, very flexible. You see one idea against one move, but you don't get attached to it, and you kind of reevaluate the position with a fresh pair of eyes. So if you forget about rook d5 for a second, there's a much more natural move oh, here that gives a humongous initiative. Yeah. Because after queen c6, what is the most accurate way of liquidating? Bingo, knight c7 wins the exchange. So <laughs> yes. it might appear that this is nothing to write home about, but I think this problem really emphasizes well the sort of art of logical thinking. You, you use mm -hmm. calculation here to rule out knight takes b5 and, and rook takes d8. And then you use sort of flexibility and ideation, I guess, to come up with responses to queen c7 and queen b6. So this happened mm -hmm. in the game, rook t5, and it's a very cool position. You're attacking these two pieces. How is bishop d6 here met? Um, with, wait a minute, just rook takes e5. Yeah, simply rook takes e5, and uh, you win two pieces for a rook, and white is completely mm -hmm. winning. And in the game, I think black took here. Uh, the sur surprisingly, the move knight takes b5 ensued. No, <laughs> surprisingly. Mind-blowing, mind-blowing <laughs> move. Um, Who would have guessed? I know. Impossible to, to realize that would have been that would have followed. Bishop d6. And now, simply, knight takes d6 and rook takes d6 um, is very good for okay. white. And it's very important to also realize this bishop on h6, always a huge asset in the endgame, mm -hmm. because it's cutting off the king, and it's already creating a precedent, potentially, for various types of mating nets and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, so if knight c4 for example what would be it m might appear that black is picking off the pawn on e4 but what would be white's most sort of clinical response here um rook d4 yeah exactly and what's the idea yeah. after knight takes b2 just play rook b1 and just go for the b7 pawn yeah so oh so wait also, the knight's also just trapped yeah the knight is trapped and you can also go bishop c1 here that's actually the most accurate to trap the knight oh okay okay so i uh, notice um, how like you're never stopping the search for tactics for concrete solutions to the position you're always looking for stuff is the knight trapped yeah, you know suddenly because rook b1 doesn't work of rook d8 bingo so rook b1 is less accurate there's rook, rook actually rook e d8 or rook a d8 and mm -hmm. uh, the game goes on. White is still much better here after rook before rook takes b7, but black right. is saved as knight. A knight is a knight. <laughs> right, exactly. And that speaks to the fact that every single position, doesn't matter how much of an innocuous endgame it might look like, features these tricks. You know, chess is full of these little tactical tricks that you have to be aware of at every single moment in the game. You can never stop the search for them. Mm-hmm.
Um, Got it. So there's one more concept that I wanted to talk about through the lens of one more game. This is a game, um, and I have to preface this because it is a game of Jan Nepomniches, but it is one that he Ooh. lost. But oh. I swear, I swear that I land this beforehand. I this is no way any kind of diss. I greatly appreciate the raid, and uh, Jan is is a player that I respect to the <laughs> utmost degree. So it has nothing to do with any of that. I think it's just an instructive objectively an instructive game <laughs> um and i'm sure it is one that jan you know probably has forgotten a long time ago because this the year of this game was 2012 oh. this wow, was basically okay. eight years ago this was exactly eight years ago and it speaks to a concept that i call the wish list um and i'll talk about what that concept entails in a moment when i face the position so nepo was uh was white and a russian grandmaster by the name of uh Dmitry Ferdanov was uh, was black, and we actually joined the battle here in an opening. Uh, it was, it's been a Slav defense, and this, um, it's, this is one of the more interesting Slavs I've seen. Yeah, it got pretty interesting. It got pretty unbalanced when Black took on c4 and played e5. So Black to move here, well, obviously, because the bishop is hanging. And let me introduce to you the concept first, and then I'll let you think about the position. So <laughs> the concept of a wish list is basically what I think players don't do enough of is when a critical moment arises in the game, what I mean by that is you have a certain decision to be made. Mm -hmm. And clearly the impact of this decision is quite significant, as it is here. You have to decide where you're putting the bishop. Um, you have to keep in mind, you know, like you're making a wish list for Christmas or whatever. You're like, I want a, I want a new Tesla. I want a house I'm in the best part of the town. I want this and this and this. And most likely you're not going to achieve, you know, even 1%. But even if you achieve like half a percent of your wish list, if you're thinking big, it's sort of more lucrative, more beneficial to have lofty ambitions than to uh -huh. have, you know, uh, to have low ambitions. And it's the same thing in chess. When you're looking at a position, you have to try to figure out what you want to achieve in an ideal scenario. Imagine that everything goes according to how you want it to go. You can manipulate the game artificially to trade the pieces that you want to trade, remove the pieces that you want to remove, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. If you actually do the work of asking yourself what the ideal scenario is, oftentimes you will find hidden resources in the position that allow you to actually accomplish those goals and turn them into reality. Whereas if you don't do that, you won't even be looking for creative solutions to these problems. So try okay. to apply this here with black to move. Um, you don't have to do that exactly in that fashion. Um, but I think that is the best way to arrive at the solution. So we just, we just do what we want to do. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay. Now, well, I mean, yeah, what's anno what what annoys touch. you about this? Like every type of question that you can ask yourself, you should go ahead and ask yourself. Well, I, yeah, I mean, my, my bishop is just flat out being attacked. Um, yep. position is feeling very uncomfortable. Not going to lie. Like I, it's just the knight is already on F5. The bishop is on C4. It's just aimed at my king. This feels like a Spanish gone really, really wrong. Exactly. Good, good observation so far. <laughs> um, yeah, and my light square bishop is unable to be developed within the next two moves because knight sitting here. Um, so if I were to play something like, you know, bishop to f4 would probably make a lot of sense because I have less space. Mm -hmm. So I just want to get rid of some of my material. Mm -hmm. So you want to you want to orchestrate some trades here in order mm -hmm. to le lessen the load, so to speak. But yeah. again, let's let's think about this from an ideal perspective. What piece would you really like to remove from the board? What is annoying you the most? My opponents or mine? Your opponents. Uh, knight on f5. Definitely the knight on f5, right? That's, that's mm -hmm. sort of, if you get rid of that knight, at least your load is slightly lessened. You're not as imminently in danger in terms of your king's safety. Um, so you should actually keep that in mind because... When you come up with an ambition like that, you should at least spend a little bit of time trying to figure out maybe there is a way that I can remove that knight by force. Because if you move your bishop, let's say, to f8, what happens then? Well, white has a chance to apply further pressure on your position by means of bishop g5. And here things get really hairy. All right. Um, so let's go back to this position. And here you can think in that type of way. Okay, um, so if I'm trying to remove the knife, my bishop is still under attack. Right, so obviously got to do things in sequence to how to take care of the bishop. Maybe you can take mm -hmm. care of the bishop in a certain way. Uh, 
I mean, the, the bishop would also look pretty good on e5. Yeah, so bishop b5 is, is probably the second best move behind sort of the top move. Oh. But what are you sort of what is your next move going to be in a position like this? Um, knight b6 and okay. bishop takes f5. Now, maybe you could do that all in one fell swoop, though. Oh, because if I play knight b6 and knight takes d6, I've got. That loses because the knight on d6 then simultaneously. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, but, that doesn't look right. <laughs> but you can do something with your bishop of a forcing nature. Oh, there's bishop h2. There and is, then there's which knight is an outlandish h6. looking move. But if you play bishop mm -hmm. h2, let's go along with this for a second. King h1, black to move. Okay, now I do actually have. Uh, I mean, there's even knight e5 too, but. Right, knight b6 cool. is sort of less. And some people in the chat were suggesting 95, but remember, as my coach would tell me, you're not writing a book during yeah. a game. You're trying to score points. So 95 has no at, no benefits other than looking kind of cool, cool, rad because you're, oh, I'm leaving the bishop hanging. I'm so cool. But the reality is after bishop b3, um, it bites you in the in the you-know-where because uh, now the bishop has no escape squares. So knight b6 yeah. actually allows you to go down and accomplish another item on the wish list because bishop b3 is forced. Now go ahead and reap the benefits. One comment here. Why is knight takes e4 bad? Because some people with a sharp tactical eye might notice that this move seems to win a pawn. And it does, but it's still bad. <laughs> it's still bad. It's still bad. Why is it bad? It just feels very, very unsafe. Yeah, honestly. exactly. It, and it is. Uh, but you have to find sort of the concrete manifestation of, of why, why that is. Thank you so much, Nicola. Thank you. Um, okay. Wait. Okay, so, I mean, obviously, knight takes e4 is going to win the knight. But then you've got bishop takes f5, and then you've got knight f6. Bingo. Oh, that's exactly right. Attack. <laughs> that's exactly right. And people might look at this and say, wait a minute, but this doesn't win anything. Why is this good? But just look at the position for a second. Everything is just the pawn structure is weak. Black's whole position here is collapsing. There's a million threats, mm -hmm. and you found that. Into I like your instincts there. <laughs> so it's not only about. It's not always about winning material. Sometimes the position can just be overwhelming. So let's say I go queen e five just to test your your tactical sharpness a little bit. How do you actually finish black off in a position like this? Um. You go bishop takes f seven. Ooh, I didn't even see that possibility. <laughs> I don't know if it works. I just said no, it. Do it, because... do it. Let's see it. Let, you can play it on the board. Let's see if that okay. actually wins. I think it, it just might. Oh, okay. I think it's, isn't it just checkmate? Oh, well, wait, I gotta no, go no, here, no, right? No. If I go yeah, king yeah, f8, yeah. bishop h6 is mate. So. <laughs> oh my god, my But, brain. man, this is scary for black. So I actually. I mean, can... I just like move my my bishop out. Um... Yeah, like to e3, then you go rook e1. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. I think from a human perspective, it's just. But black is busted. I don't see anybody would be able to defend this. Um, but if you were, like, I, as I like to say, an old Russian. Not an old Russian. If you were an old Russian, you would pay attention to this bishop on h2. The queen has cut off its retreat square. So if you can move your queen away with tempo, you uh, have yes. a certain way of cutting off the bishop. And how exactly? G3 or even okay. more... With tempo, what other move do you Oh, have? F4. Either actually works. I think G3 works as well. Okay. Nothing wrong with that. But F4 wins the game immediately because, yeah, you just take off, take the bishop. Next yeah, time. or I'm going to... I'd probably play, like, bishop takes F7 because that's the first thing. No, but that's actually a very nice move. And I think it has a great amount of practical value. Um, <laughs> it has a great amount of practical value. So, in any case, um, that is why knight takes E4 doesn't work and you take the bishop on the knight on F5. And in this position... You've accomplished sort of the top item on your wish list, but there's one more item that you can accomplish here. And I'd like you to try to tell me what that is and with what move you can accomplish it. Okay, wait, that involves me actually deciding what else I want to yeah, do. Yeah, exactly. It involves you trying to find the next move. <laughs> um, okay, so what else do I want to do here? I've got in my... I've gotten the night nitrated. I've, I've gotten like a little bit more space now. It's feeling okay here. Um, I think I probably just want to play something like... Ooh. I mean, my bishop is still like 
on H2. I yeah, would still yeah play... that's something you should keep in mind with your peripheral mm-hmm. vision. So it would be great if you could simultaneously solve the problem of that bishop, but also accomplish something while you're at it. Okay, well, this, 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 something, this something is uh, something that I need to think about because exactly, I haven't found it yet. Exactly, yeah. Take okay. your time. So what can you accomplish with that bishop on H2 is the key question here. Okay, this is this is where I actually don't know. Um, so I, can I give want. You a hint if you if if you if you. Okay. Can. So, what are White's assets here? Let's let's think about it from White's perspective for a second. What assets does White have from a general perspective? The pair of bishops. Yeah, exactly. So, could you get rid of that? Yeah. So, I want to go bishop f four. Exactly. That would be the right. Right. Move. So. I, I just wanted to play bishop f four, but I didn't exactly like. That's that. it. Yeah. There's cool. nothing. I I, I, I maybe I misled you a little bit. Yeah. Okay. Oh, Nepo Nepo says, "Wow, this seems familiar." Yeah. Um, oh, he just said. <laughs> he's in the, yeah, 2012. Wow, that's awesome memory. Eight years ago, and he remembers the year. Um, oh, so Bishop F4 is the move, and and Black went on to win the game. It's not that overwhelming, but it's very unpleasant for White because of the pawn structure. Um, <laughs> man, I don't know how this Nepo guy became a GM. I mean, like clearly. Like all he does is lose games, man. That's like. I mean, I just want to say he played some really, really cool games against Geary um, this tournament because I was doing the casting every single morning. So, uh, Levy and I like really saw some beautiful games. Yep, oh. and and he, he kept, kicked my butt in Blitz a couple days ago. Consider that sort of retroactive revenge for me showing, uh, for me showing <laughs> this loss. Thank you, Pihar, for gifting to uh, to Jan. Um, so, anyways, uh, now Bishop E five would be quite a bit inferior because it would allow this bishop to develop to g5. And sometimes you just got to think in terms as simple as what are the assets that my opponent has? Can I eliminate any of those assets? Here he has the bishop pair. Can I eliminate the bishop pair? Yes. And then white is left with these weaknesses, these pawn weaknesses, and that he can't even compensate them with the bishop pair. And Nepo says, I remember I didn't see bishop f4 India until it was played. Yeah, and sometimes you sort of miss... <laughs> You sort of miss these moves in the course of your thought. You think about complicated things, and then you miss sort of the the simple retreats. Mm-hmm. Um, so bishop f4 is, is 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 better for black, and so this kind of encapsulates, epitomizes the concept of a wish list. Many t- many different types of positions. People are just very pessimistic in general. They're like, I can't do this. I can't get this done. I can't get that done. I take the opposite stance and ask myself, what is the best what is the equivalent of you know finding a tesla on the street that's unowned with its keys in the ignition oh, okay so I, right, I, I was trying to craft that Daniel. in a way so as not to suggest that i'm st- that i'm stealing cars in my spare time um and 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 by asking yourself that you are opening your eyes to possibilities that otherwise you're Otherwise, pessimistic brain would not necessarily consider. And I think everyone tends to be a pessimist on the chessboard. You have mm-hmm. to artificially inflate yourself with a little bit of optimism. That is true. That um, is definitely true. Teslas have wireless keys. I'm sorry, I can't even get that right. I can't get any analogies right. My analogies inevitably contain some sort of mistake. So apologies <laughs> for that. Hey, unconventional. Okay. Um, so those are a couple of concepts that I wanted to lay out for you today. Um, so just to recap, first we considered sort of purely positional solutions. Um, and there were a couple of things in that regard that, that you can take away. The first is obviously never to switch off your tactical detector. Um, there are situations in which you might classify the position in a particular way, and that hurts you from looking for tactics. You shouldn't try to label positions as tactical or positional. We're taught to do that by things like puzzles, uh, which we kind of label as tactics, but real chess isn't kind of like that. Remember that game with knight c7, knight a6? The line between positional thinking and tactics was blurred. Number two, um, the concept of inaccessibility and making concessions. Don't be afraid to do things like weaken a square or, I don't know, put a piece on a bad square temporarily if you are achieving other aims. Sometimes that is necessary. Yes. Um, and a couple of other things we talked about that you can sort of internalize uh, on your own time as well. Yeah, I'll definitely be reviewing the VOD. 